and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. My name is Neil Clark, Extension Forester for Eastern Virginia. I'm standing here in the Virginia Tech Arboretum uh, in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, this specific area is the uh, Utility Arboretum, uh, which was established by the late uh, Bonnie Appleton uh, several decades ago. Um, in addition to establishing this Arboretum, she assembled a concise publication entitled 24 Ways to Kill a Tree. People always ask me why in the world would we write a publication on how to kill a tree? Of course on the back of the page was the descriptions on how not to kill a tree. Uh, she was good at getting uh, people's attention and, uh, and making her, her points quickly. Uh, this publication number 430-210 can be obtained by contact contacting me or your local extension office. The elegance of this was that nearly every common mistake people made it was simply and concisely laid out. I'm not going to attempt to tackle all 24 in this video, but merely a selection of those that may be avoidable for urban tree plantings in the early stages. There are several things to look out for. So this is sort of a follow-up to Adam Downing's uh, May 21st, uh, 2021 uh, uh, planting tree video um, with just a few extra uh, points um, for putting those trees uh, in the urban environment. The first most being, the reason I'm here, is to uh, put the right tree in the right place. The first being site selection. So the reason I'm in the utility arboretum is one place we do not want to plant trees is in the utility rights of ways uh, right underneath the utility lines. Um, obviously a large statue tree in an urban environment uh, that would be some space away. Uh, you can plant adjacent and depending on the branching structure of the tree, uh, the tree may be able to be pruned uh, around the utility line and still have uh, some, uh, some functioning, some aesthetic and not get in the way of the uh, power lines. Also want to be concerned with that as far as the space on the ground as well. Uh, whether you have enough uh, soil area, sometimes are these in the urban areas uh, along uh, medians or um, between sidewalks and roadways can have very narrow soil pits and you want to make sure you select the uh, tree or maybe even shrub that is suitable uh, for that space. Trees are somewhat like puppies in that they're all cute and manageable when they are small, but they can uh, become unruly as well as difficult and expensive to maintain if not in the right place. So please do not plant large trees directly beneath power lines. In addition to the overhead utilities, you want to also be aware of uh, the space that you have uh, on the ground. You don't want to plant it uh, uh, too close to your septic uh, system if you have if you have those. Uh, other underground uh, utilities that you may either have and not want to bother or that may uh, frequently need to be dug up to, to repair. So even a, a optical cable line which a tree would probably not uh, damage or disturb uh, if the cable company is coming through uh, every every few months or every couple of years to uh, put a new line in uh, then your roots will continue to be severed in that area maybe it was not a uh, great choice and as you will see in this video um, trees uh, trees are they fight the good fight many times and many times uh, these things and I say prevent harm to trees uh, many of these things may not outright uh, kill the tree, however they may uh, damage the tree, keeping the tree from, uh, from uh, having the, the longevity that you would desire for it to have. Um, they may put the tree in a hazardous condition uh, that you could avoid by uh, using good practices ahead of time. Uh, and, and part of those good practices are putting the right trees uh, where they belong and uh, leaving other trees uh, to grow uh, in more uh, in 
settings where they have more space and where they are more appropriate. Um, so I mentioned site selection first. Uh, you know, you want to plant it in a uh, appropriate soil that's, uh, that's you know, either well drained or, uh, or if it's not well drained, you want to plant a uh, some of the few species that are adapted to wet environments. And particularly organic mulch, uh, which uh, in large part are wood chips or wood bark uh, uh, mulch that has been uh, aged for a little while. Uh, initially, in the first um, few weeks, uh, that, that those materials start to decompose and break down, um, there is some some heat exchange, so try to uh, have mulch where it's been uh, started to decompose for a few weeks, at least. That being said, uh, he did mention to avoid uh, the mulch volcanoes, and if you live in any city around here uh, and driving to this location, uh, I saw hundreds of, of mulch volcanoes, so uh, as much as we uh, in extension, uh, preach the, this uh, concept and, uh, and things like that. Um, it's still not a marketable concept, or it's, it's not one that uh, has, has often gained traction uh, in the corporate uh, environment. I think it has quite a bit in the uh, homeowner uh, landscape environment. Adam touched on the fact that organic mulch provides a cooler, moister environment and, and improves soil properties as it decomposes. He mentioned that it only needs to be about three inches deep. But also, we need to mention that it should be at least three inches from the trunk. This prevents the mulch from becoming a decay vector to the bark, uh, eliminates adventitious root formation above grade, and it also exposes that root flare discouraging uh, any feeding by voles and, uh, and other critters that may uh, like the cambial tissue. Here we see a northern red oak that was planted five years ago. You immediately see the mound of mulch. Upon closer inspection, you see that the root collar has erupted. This more than likely was a result of a pathogen introduced due to the constant moisture produced by the mounded mulch. Perhaps insect vectors were involved and the possibility of other cambium damage already present. Assuredly, this collar decay played a significant role in this tree's demise. You can also see the adventitious roots that have formed within the mulch mound. These are quite de detrimental under the drought conditions present when this video was captured. Another practical purpose of mulch early on is to prevent mower deck and weed eater damage and for that further the potential of these low wounds to pick up soil borne pathogens which can splash into these open wounds and then proliferate. You also want to avoid the use of the non-porous black plastic weed barriers. This product often creates excessive heat and moisture conditions that will cause pathogens to flourish. The next question is staking or not? Not all trees need to be staked, but if you are in an urban environment long, it does not take long before you see many new trees um, that are staked. This is common practice to see in new urban plantings. One reason people uh, do this is they tend to want to jumpstart, to plant as large of a tree as they can afford. A lot of times in urban construction, specifications are written by planters on tree uh, size and caliper and those trees uh, which are usually um, a, a fairly large uh, tree for a nursery stock are um, planted in that in that space. In reality a small seedling with a balanced root shoot ratio could catch up uh, with a tree that has a large top and a relatively small root ball. The nursery industry does have ANSI standards that are related to root ball size, height, and caliper. But trees are planted year-round due to scheduling. 
Although fall would be the preferable time for planting in most cases, spring seems to be a popular time for folks to get outside, spruce up their yards, and that's when many trees are planted. And so often these um, nursery stock, the shoots take off in their growth, especially if they're fertilized and, and uh, spurred along, and may uh, exceed their root capacity. And at this time, the roots have also not uh, had the time to grow into the surrounding soil, thus anchoring the tree. So a lot of times, landscape contractors uh, will stake the trees uh, upon initial planting um, for insurance purposes to keep them from, from blowing over. Likewise, these uh, nursery stock were typically raised uh, in a nursery in rows and groups of trees uh, where uh, neighboring trees helped uh, buffer them from wind forces and things like that. Uh, now these trees are now solitarily planted uh, out usually in very open spaces and subject to much higher uh, wind forces. And let's not forget the human element. There's trees planted near a playground, school or park one cannot count out the fact that young folks may bend, pull, or otherwise manipulate the tree, not thinking that it could be damaged. Besides, it's a tree, right? Indestructible. Well, not quite yet. So sometimes staking helps to communicate that the tree is not yet grown enough to climb. The most important thing is to remember to remove the tree straps or wires uh, after the first or at most second year if they are not designed to snap off automatically. The wires on some of the trees in this video have been on for longer than eight years. Saturated soil. I see this likely often more than most being in the coastal plain where the water tables are high and soil is not always well drained. However, this can happen anywhere. Trees may often be delegated to damp areas where folk might not want to be able to mow. Uh, in urban areas, it could be put near downspouts or ditches and ravines. So you want to make sure that you avoid uh, overwatering and also compaction, which reduces uh, drainage. Keep in mind that it is better to water a tree thoroughly a couple times a week than to water it lightly every day. Depending on the soil, air and water pore space will balance out with the wet and dry cycles, allowing oxygen and gas exchange to occur. Constant dampness fosters faster anaerobic conditions um, and possibly allowing pathogens to take over. Super wet conditions in the summer can result in root rots which are frequently fatal to young trees. So it's okay to love your trees, just don't love them to death. I also wanted to mention along the frame of the volcano mulch, um, I see a lot of people, even this is even with um, mature trees, uh, that love to take that area block it off and make this nice flower garden uh, that may be foot deep uh, at the base of the tree. Um, I've seen many uh, occasions where I've gotten calls, particularly in droughts, uh, where those trees have, have lost their leaves. Uh, and again, the same purpose, a lot of those roots that should be in the ground at soil level are in that planter box. And when that planter box does not have the water, it normally gets you know, plants are growing and that kind of thing, uh, that's actually a detriment uh, to the tree. So loving your trees to death, that goes for fertilization as well. Um, fertilizers these days are coming in more concentrated forms, they're coming in bigger containers uh, that are cheaper. So uh, if a little bit is good, then a lot is better, right? And uh, in a young tree, a lot of times, you want to kind of give them a kickstart and so they're planted in the spring and you want to, uh, people often apply a lot of nitrogen to make them green and make all the leaves uh, flourish and flush and uh, you create this nice big canopy but just remember that root base is still the size it is it needs to feed that canopy it needs to be able to get as much water as that canopy is requiring so a lot of times this particularly heavy nitrogen fertilizer uh, is not a great idea in the spring if you want to fertilize it, again, wait till fall and I'll have that phosphorus uh, in there to uh, 
to, to be able to, to grow and enhance those roots uh, more. And then they'll be able to uh, hold more leaves in the spring. And I wouldn't be a good extension agent if I didn't recommend the best thing to uh, actually do is to uh, get a soil test and, uh, and get that evaluated and then you can apply uh, the correct amount of lime or fertilizer uh, that that tree will need um, for, its, uh, for its young growth. Thank you for joining us for another 15 minutes in the forest. Please remember to uh, hit like and subscribe. And uh, remember to join us next week, July 23rd, where J Karen Snape will be talking to us about native flowering trees.